This next guy, he's he's uh, something else. He's a piece of work. No, actually, uh, <laughs> not you yet, Dave. You're coming up next. <laughs> Actually, guys, I'm going to take just a few minutes and uh, share with you some, some uh, uh, I would say these are things that I hope that you can go and it makes you money. Let's put it that way. Um, so rather than talking too much about lighting, which you guys have all heard so many incredible talks throughout the last couple of days, I definitely see some familiar faces, but um, if you haven't, stick around. There's one more. Dave Shea is going to uh, share a talk right after this. Uh, but for now, I'm going to take like 15 or 20 minutes or so and just share some things that for me that I use in my work in order to generate money, okay? So, does that sound good? Can we do that? And of course, there's some lighting stuff in here, but, uh, but that's mainly what I'm gonna talk about. Um, so this very first app that I just wanted to share, if, if, if nobody has it, uh, is, is called Soul. I believe it's free, if I'm not mistaken. I typically don't pay very much for apps if I do pay for them. Um, but uh, Soul, the reason I love using it is because I will bring up the date and time of the wedding and the location and then based on that I can find out exactly when that sunset is but you can see here the most important time is this part right here the civil dusk and so oftentimes wedding planners couples they don't understand that when you say sunset that doesn't mean we're done shooting that doesn't mean it's dark that just means that the Sun is literally on its verge of setting and then about 15 to 20 minutes after is when we call civil dusk, which is when the amazing skies happen. And that's the best time to be shooting those sunsets. So if you guys love off camera light and using MagMod modifiers, you definitely want to be shooting during civil dusk, right? And so I love this app because I can visually show my clients. I can bring it up, bring up their date of their wedding and show it to them. Now, when I say my clients, oftentimes I'm actually using this before anyone is even a client. So we're sitting down at, uh, you know, the coffee shop, we're talking about their wedding, and they're saying, hey, you know, show us some of your work, etc." I start planning their wedding day with them. Start putting it together, bring up the app, we talk about the location, talk about when the sunset is, and I talk about it as a we, as a team, so that they already are incorporating me, they're already visualizing me in their wedding day. So, if you don't use this app already, definitely use it. Like I said, you just change the location, see the sunset, and then it's great because then you can start putting together that timeline for them before the wedding coordinators say, hey, sunset, 4.49, so let's do the grand entrance at 4.50. And you're like, great, I got no sunset shots. So that's the first one I want to share. Uh, the second one is photo pills. Anyone seen photo pills? Now, I believe this one does cost like $10. Again, it's one of those that I've had for probably three years, so I can't recall exactly. Uh, but the way I love using this app is I will actually bring it up and I can actually see the location, so kind of like a satellite image of where I'm gonna be shooting. And then based on that, I can actually see where the sun's gonna be going, right, at what time of the day. Now why that's important, I'm gonna actually share another feature of this app here in just a second. But why that's important is oftentimes when I'm planning the day, one of the biggest questions I get from wedding coordinators is where would you like the family to meet for the family photos? Where would you like me to tell them which part of the resort or the venue would you like to do the family photos? And in Arizona, we do a lot of golf course weddings. And so I love being able to pull this up and I'll actually send a screenshot to the wedding coordinators, especially if they've never worked with me before. I'll send a screenshot of the venue and I'll, lose, I'll kind of mark it up on my phone and say, hey, right here looks amazing because the light's gonna be behind us. I don't have to have them looking into the sun and I already know that it's gonna be a great garden right here. We'll shoot right between these trees. Does that work for you? And they're like, who are you? Like, this is amazing. Like, I love being able to have this this visual representation and a reason why, not just like, oh, tell the family to meet in the lobby and we'll figure it out from there. So being able to plan makes money, right? It makes money for you. The other cool thing about photo pills is you can actually, if you're ever at a location, how many of you have ever had a bride and couple, or excuse me, a bride and groom say, hey, can you meet us at the venue? We're gonna walk around and kind of look at the place. I, it's funny, I, I never really feel like those are necessary, but it's fun. I mean, it's a nice meeting to hang out with the bride and groom and say, oh yeah, we'll definitely shoot at that tree or over there by that bridge or whatever. But what I love when I do go to those meetings is I'll bring up this app and oftentimes it's just more for show than anything else, but it has an AR function down here. And what that does is literally when I click on it, it brings up a live camera so I can point it at the location and I can say, oh look, on your wedding day, at this time, the sun's gonna be right there. And I can actually see exactly where it's gonna be. 
A great example is JD over here. He was actually getting married and we went and we walked around with it. And we saw that they, they, they saw these two trees. They were saying, hey, we're gonna probably get married at a ceremony right here. But when we looked on the app, we said, well, if you do that, half of you are gonna be in the sun, half of you are gonna be in the shade. And so we rotated the ceremony a little bit so we had the sun behind us so we didn't have to worry about that. So things like that are really important just to be able to plan and show that, hey, you're a professional, you're planning to create beautiful images for the couple, the family, the wedding coordinator, et cetera. Cool? So for me, like I said, I think it's $10. It's been a long time since I bought it, but it's well worth it and it's booked weddings for me left and right. Something else that I love doing is just creating that timeline that includes sunset photos. Now, there's a great book. I think it's, gosh, I'm trying to remember which one was it was. It was Willpower Doesn't Work. I think it was Willpower Doesn't Work. But they talk about, oh no, I'm sorry, I think it was The One Thing is the name of the book. But he talks about forcing functions. And forcing functions is basically when you actually say, I am going to do sunset photos at this time, you know, during your wedding day. Uh, what that does for me is it basically says, hey Trevor, you better be ready. <laughs> you better have your lights ready, you better have your modifiers ready, etc. If I don't put these things in, oftentimes it just gets pushed down the way, right? Have you guys have ever seen when things run late, who gets cut out of the, the piece of the cake? It's typically the photographers, right? Oh man, the hair and makeup went a little bit late, we'll just have to uh, make uh, the photos uh, 30 minutes instead of 45 minutes or whatever. So this is basically including my sunset photos into the timeline. Now you might notice here, I actually included about 25 minutes of sunset photos. Uh, but it's basically telling them like, hey, this is what's gonna happen. And then after I do that, I'm gonna run them, go do reception details. And then 15 minutes later, you can have the guests enter the ballroom. So make sure to include that, include that forcing function. It tells the bride and groom you're gonna do it. It tells yourself you're gonna do it. And then you're gonna prepare and you're gonna be ready for it as opposed to just like, hey, let's go shoot, and oh, look, we have some time, let's do some sunset photos. Cool? All right. What we do is plan your sunset photos at this time. That's what I was telling the people. Now, something else that I, just a little tip, and then we'll get into some photos as well. Uh, something that I love doing as well is if you have an Apple Watch, if you don't, go buy one, but if you, ha if you have one already, what I love doing is I put the whole calendar on the wedding day in my watch, so that throughout the day, this is the Apple Watch, you can customize this a lot. So like right now it's telling me the next thing on my calendar is I got a flight at 9.15 tonight. But on the wedding day, what I do is I can just easily look down and see the timeline, what's coming up next. So I know immediately, oh at 3.30, I gotta shoot bridal party or whatever. So basically all these things, it just tells me what's coming up next. And it's an easy way for me just to kind of take a sneak peek real fast without taking out my phone, without looking at paper. Just a really quick and easy way. It's something that I love doing and it takes maybe 10 minutes to plug it into my calendar and be done with it. Question for you guys. Who is your biggest competition? What's their name? Trevor Daly. Trevor Daly, okay. Then you're gonna be A-okay. Who's your biggest competition? I actually don't want to know their names, but think about it for a second. Who is your biggest competition? I'm gonna guess that most of you probably have the same person in mind. Maybe you don't have this person in mind, but I'm gonna guess all of you are probably having the same thing, which your biggest competition is technology. Quite honestly, nowadays cameras are getting such, so easy. You guys, 15, 20 years ago, to be a photographer, it was not easy. You had to invest in film, you had to know how to develop the stuff, you had to know how to do the prints. Actually, I should go back even further, maybe 25, 30 years ago. It was tough. It was tough to get into it. Now it's so easy. It's so easy to do. And not only that, but then we get these iPhones, right? And you're like describing to people, you're saying, oh yeah, we're gonna get some bokeh. And they're like, oh yeah, I love bokeh. That's awesome. Yeah, I got this tilt shift lens. Oh yeah, I totally do that on my iPhone all the time. I got uh, eye focus, I got nighttime mode. Now these phones, every time they come out, it's better and better and better. And so your, your competition is not the person down the street. Your competition is the technology that's just gonna basically steal business from you. So you really gotta be ready for that. So basically what I wanna show is just some photos that, again, going back to the idea in the beginning, which is how can you make more money in this industry or how can you actually differentiate yourself? I wanna show you some photos that for me, I feel like helped me make some money. It separates me from technology. Nobody with an iPhone is going to go do this kind of stuff. I'm not saying that people are going to go, hey, you're not worth it, we're going to go do an iPhone. I'm just saying we got to be careful with technology, right? So the first one is sunset photos. What do iPhones do when you shoot sunset photos? Typically pretty white, right? Either white or dark. In other words, they either blew it out or it got dark. So definitely 
do sunset photos. Now this one here is two mag bounces. There's just one on the left, one on the right. I call it my double rainbow light. It's just a really easy, simple light. But had I not used light on them, what would my background look like? It would have been white, right? In other words, in order to expose them properly, I need to underexpose the scene, or excuse me, in order to expose the sunset, I need to underexpose it, which is gonna make them dark, like you would see on these trees back here. But then I just put a little bit of light on them, okay? Same thing here, another sunset photo. I wanted to throw a few of these in here just so you can kind of see them and then just talk about them briefly. This was actually just a mag sphere on the left, a mag grid on the right. Okay, very, very simple, but again, iPhones can't do it, right? Yes, finally got it up on something. Family photo, mag box, camera left. Okay, now we're gonna get into something else that I like to do, and a lot of you have seen this before. It's my thing that I, I call it the changing skylight, but it's basically just making the sky a little bit different. Again, it's something that iPhones or somebody down the street or whatever, it's something that can separate you a little bit different than everyone else. Uh, how many of you are doing this already? You guys doing it in your work? Got a couple? Okay, got one back there. Awesome, awesome. I'll just briefly describe it just for those who haven't done it yet. In order to change the sky a different color, I don't do this in Photoshop. That would be a waste of my time. I just do it in camera. And in order to go from here to there, what do I have to do with my Kelvin white balance? So what do I need to take my white balance? You got an answer back there? 9,000? I love it. So basically I gotta take my white balance from let's say 5200 or daylight balance up to let's say 9,000 or 10,000. Now if I do that, what's gonna happen to the people? Yeah, well they're gonna be super warm, right? So they're gonna look like gold, which might cool, I mean it might be creative, it might be interesting, but in order to make them look normal, I have to put a blue gel on them. So I have to basically take one of these gels. I'm gonna dance here, that was awesome. I'm gonna take one of those gels right over there and I'm gonna get a blue one. We have what's called a CTB gel and I'm gonna put that CTB gel in my gel holder and it's gonna put that light on them, right? Okay, so again, something that I can actually do that, hey, person down the street might not be able to, person with the phone might not be able to, right? Set my, separate myself. This is the exact same per couple, obviously. Um, do they look right? They look uncolor balanced, right? What color do they look? Green, right? The reason I put green light on them is because I wanted them to stand out from the sky. I wanted to make the sky a different color. I wanted to make it magenta. In order to do that, I just put green light on them and then I shift my white balance in camera. So again, a really, really easy, super simple trick that will separate you and make you a little bit different than everyone else. Another thing that is, uh, I love doing is environmental portraiture. But when I do, I should, I should say, portraits in really cool environments. The interesting thing is sometimes they can get lost, right? But what I like to do is I'll put a little bit of light on that couple and make them stand out. Do you guys see where the light's at? Right over here, right? Right there. Um, now what am I using there to put that light on them? Anyone know that tool? That's our mag beam, okay? So I'm using the mag beam, I'm just putting a little bit of light here. The reason I put that over there is if you might notice, this is actually how you get up to the parking lot. So we hiked on down here, there was a beautiful beach down there that we hung out at. But the trail goes right through here. I did not want to put my light stand in the middle of this gorgeous vegetation. I didn't want to ruin that. Um, also, it's volcanic rock, so it's like very difficult to put your light stand. But I put it down over here to the side, and with that mag beam, I'm able to project a beam of light and light them up. Now I can shoot either further back, or I can get it nice and close and still light them up, and, and be able to use that mag beam to light what I need up without having it nice and close on them, okay? So again, I just want to mention a few of these tools that I like to use. This is the same concept. This beautiful young lady is actually my daughter. She got the good looks from her mom. Um, but this was her 15th birthday. For any of you in the Latin culture, which my wife is from South America, they do quinceañeras. And quinceañeras is an opportunity where they go out, they get dressed up, and they look beautiful, and we go out and take pictures. So we took Annabelle out to Picacho Peak, and I love where she's standing, I love everything about it, but this is not what my eye saw. My eye saw this beautiful sky behind her. Unfortunately, my camera can't capture it. Neither can iPhones and people that don't know how to use light, right? In other words, they don't have that dynamic range. Now maybe I could come in here and replace the sky and do something like that, but I like to do it natural if I can. So Annabelle's standing up there, I'm saying, hey, this looks beautiful, but hold on a second, Annabelle, I'm gonna go grab something, I'm gonna get a tool that I wanna use to make this a little bit different. So I run up there, I grab the mag beam, so you can see the beam right up here. 
I put it on a light stand. This is my wife, it's a friend Jimmy. But I put it on a light stand up here and I really don't want anyone having to hang out over here. I just put it up there, fired at her. This is my daughter, Emma, hanging on my back um, as I'm shooting. She's like five or six years old, five years old. I sometimes lose count, I have six kids. Um, seven kids, not yet, never. <laughs> We're done, factory shut. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, my, my wife just texted me and said no more. Um, so Emma's hanging on me. You see the mag beam up there, and when I fire it down, it, it's pointed right at Annabelle. And again, the difference that this makes, be, be, you know, compared to just a normal flash just firing at something, is that it's going to create that beam of light, right? So when I do that, I fire it down, I get this beautiful shot right on Annabelle, and now I can actually underexpose the scene and actually see the sky as my eye saw it. I saw the beautiful light, I saw the sun setting, but my camera wasn't able to capture it in that last shot, okay? So again, how can you differentiate yourself? How can you beat technology that's out there and actually do things that you have to use your creative mindset and actually, you know, use flash, okay? Um, this is one of those shots that, gosh, I have so many grooms that say, you know, hey babe, whoever you wanna hire as a photographer, totally up to you. Whatever you, want, whatever you wanna do, honey. You wanna plan the wedding, totally fine. Your wedding, I'm not really into it. And then all of a sudden I show the groom one of these shots, and he's like, oh dude, let's hire this guy. I want him on the wedding day. And it just separates you. All this is, is it's, I call it my cigar lighting. He happens to be smoking a cigar, but it's just looking right here, and then let's say that speaker is my light. I'm just having him look towards the light, right? Use the mag box, 24 inch mag. This was actually shot, it wasn't shot with the mag box, because it was shot about three years ago before the mag box even existed, but it was a soft box just like that, just 24 inches. Have him look right towards it, and get a nice gradient on the face. I use these all the time to show when I'm being interviewed by bride and grooms uh, and as an op opportunity to show the groom like, hey, I want to make you look awesome as well as make her look beautiful. Uh, yeah. So you've got the mag box over here uh -huh. and then he's looking at what light over here. Yeah, actually, uh, Timothy, can you bring me that mag box real quick? I don't want to walk up there because I'm going to, the speaker's going to give me feedback. So let me show you exactly where I have this place. So usually I'll raise it up just a little bit. I'll have it right about eye level. Just one light? One light, uh-huh. Yeah, there's nothing in the back here. Sometimes I'll add a rim light if I need to, but honestly, if you just crop it in, you can kind of get by without it. Um, but I'll have them look right here, and then just smoke, and look right towards the, the box, okay? Now you don't have to do this. They don't have to be smoking cigars. I don't smoke cigars, and honestly, by the time I'm done with this, I'm like, uh, I gotta get out of here. Um, but it's those shots that these people absolutely love. And so if I ever hear that they're gonna be doing this, or sometimes when they see the shot, they'll set it up, they'll be like, hey Trevor, we got cigars specifically so we can do this. I'll make sure that I go join them outside and, and do this shot. How close is the group to the mag box? Yeah, so the question was, how close is she to the mag box? About this far. Yeah, so, and here's a trick, guys. If you shoot this and you're like, well, why doesn't mine look like this with the gradient on the cheek and everything else? It's probably because you have them too far back. In other words, if you look at where the distance is, I'm like at the back of the mag box right here. Honestly, it's better to get them like right at the edge of the front of it and look this way. That way this light is just barely capturing this cheek over here, okay? If you find that you shoot it and there's too much light on the front of their face, it doesn't look like it has that gradient, just have them take another step forward and walk right up here, okay? In fact, you can even almost like their nose to the edge of this box right here and you typically will get a little bit of pattern coming across. And how far are you back? Uh, typically I'm like six feet maybe, it depends on which lens I use. Um, sometimes it's 35, might be the 85, sometimes even 135. Here's a trick to this shot though. After you shoot it, or I'm sorry, before you shoot it, change your camera mode to monochrome, okay? So you have it, it when I say monochrome, it's a picture style, thank you. It's a picture style. It does not affect my raw images, so I'm still shooting in raw, but when I do monochrome picture style, it shows black and white on the back of my camera and it looks really good, right? And so you show it to them and they're like, whoa. And then guess who else wants to see it? Well, basically the groom says, dude, you guys, come check this out. And then I show all the other groomsmen and they're like, whoa, can I, can I get one? Of course. And then I spend 15 minutes and I shoot all the groomsmen doing their own shots, maybe do a couple group shots. Guess who just has a really good chance of booking more six, seven weddings next, next year, right? Yeah. It's those groomsmen that now they're like, hey, sweetheart, I'm, I really want to marry you and I really want this photographer to be at our wedding as well. That's the thing, guys. If you can get that, that, that uh, the groom engaged, then all of a sudden they're going to sell the bride as well. 
So another example, this is, this is one of those guys that was basically that. Uh, hey, I, I love your cigar shots, and there's a few other shots that he pointed out, one of them being negative space. So are you underexposing on all these and using the monochrome? Yeah, so the, the, the question was, am I underexposing? Typically, I, I'm not, I, I don't really have to underexpose, I'm just exposing for the scene because automatically, I'm, I'm usually picking an area that's kind of black, and we have to do this outside. So typically, I'll go outside and we'll shoot kind of in an area that there's nothing behind us. Um, and then, like I said, it's just that one flash. So, but yeah, always shoot in monochrome. Like I said, when you download those photos into your computer, your raw images will have the color data. So don't feel like you're losing that color data, but it just looks so much better on the back of your camera, monochrome color preset. And that way they get to see black and white right then and there. Um, here's another shot that I absolutely love doing that, again, people just go, oh yeah, well, I want one of those because it's more like a piece of artwork. It's this kind of negative space. I, I call it blackout light but it's basically taking everything, getting the light in really close, being able to light up the couple, and, and creating this space back here. I've actually had couples that have asked me and said, hey, there's one guy who basically said, hey, I would love to get that one shot on our engagement session. I wanna have a big piece of artwork in our house that we can put it where basically we get that negative space. Especially if you, you know, nowadays, it seems like minimalism is really popular. Like this is the perfect minimalistic shot, right? This is also blackout light. This is just, I, I shared this this morning as well and I've shared it in a couple videos, but it, I, I like to share it only because there was literally a trash can right behind them, like not even two feet behind them. But using a mag snoop, I was able to focus that light directly on the couple and not have any of that light fall anywhere else. And here's just an example of what it looks like. Some of you might have seen this video. We have, if you are not already subscribed, go on the YouTube channel, search MagMod. There's a, a great, uh, we have a great MagMod channel. There's a lot of videos. Uh, we got our videographer Aaron over here hanging out. Say hi, Aaron. <laughs> we have, uh, and we did this challenge where we basically said, "Hey, uh, you got you got to use these mag boxes, and you got to make it look like it's nighttime, even though it's one o'clock in the afternoon." So, here is my mag boxes set up. I'm putting all the power on her, and again, making the environment look like it's you know midnight or whatever, seven o'clock when it was only one o'clock in the afternoon. So again, can technology do that? Well, actually, funny enough, our iPhones now can, right? Portrait mode, it like does that exact same thing. That's what I'm saying, that's your competition. And this is, I think this is the last one in that. This is the mag beam, actually. So the same thing that I used on my daughter, I used it here, but it was only about six feet away. And here's the fun part about this photo. You know, I used to love Paul Harvey when he'd tell the stories and then he'd say, and the rest of the story, right? Well, the rest of the story is that literally the wall behind him was about two feet back and it was a white wall and none of that light, it came right out of the mag beam, it hit him and none of it fell against that white wall. So we get this really cool, interesting portrait, uh, uh, you know, blacking out everything else and getting that light right on him without that light hitting anything else. A little bit different. Um, I want to wrap this up because I want to hear Dave. Dave's coming up next. Uh, just a couple more things. This is the mag beam. So using the mag beam pattern behind a couple. Again, interesting light, doing something different. There's an example of the behind the scenes so you guys can kind of see where it's coming from. Now, just a few things I want to point out. Sometimes people will shoot these and they'll say, but Trevor, I can't get those patterns to show up very well. So notice that I have him holding, I don't have a light stand, I have him holding it right at his hip. Notice that they're about three to four feet away. So it's big enough, far enough away that it's casting the pattern, but close enough that the pattern's still very, very clear and concise, right? Because the further you get back, the more and more that pattern's gonna spread out. And then also notice that up here, we have a mag sphere that's lighting them up. But you guys notice how I have the mag sphere up a little bit high, higher than I typically usually put it. Why did I do that? I did it so that their shadow falls down, right? Because if the mag sphere is about a foot lower, where would their shadow end up? right here on the pattern. So basically you would have their shadow rolling into the pattern, which is then therefore gonna mess things up. So keep that in mind as well when you're, you're you know, putting a pattern behind them, make sure you have the, your second light up nice and high and that it doesn't cross pollute or cause any issues there. Um, and finally, I believe this is the last photo, uh, group shots. So group shots, I love doing these uh, at night uh, with uh, everybody in the party. I, every single wedding I go to, I stick around to the very, very end. Uh, I, I, it's kind of selfish. I love being there till the end because I like to practice. So I, I shoot a lot of photos during the dance floor. I love to play around with light. I love to do different things. I love to mix motion and drag my shutters and just, that's, that's like, my, like my time to practice. And what's the difference of me going home at 10 o'clock versus midnight? My family's all asleep anyways. Like it doesn't really make a difference. So I might as well practice, right? But every time when I finish a wedding, I always do a big group shot. 
This one was a little bit more formal than usually. Typically, it's just more like everyone get together and they're all throwing their hands around each other. This was actually before the end of the night, they did a fireworks outside and nobody knew about it. So they said, hey, everyone go outside. There's gonna be a big group photo that Trevor wants to take. And then right after I shot the photo, all of a sudden these fireworks launched and it was kind of fun. But in order to do these big group shots, I'll just put a mag bounce on the right, mag bounce on the left. This was outdoors, so there's nowhere for that light to bounce off of. So I use those mag bounces to direct that light exactly where I want it. This is something I do, like I said, at the end of every wedding as a way of being able to just pull everyone together. And then what does it say? It says, wow, the photographer stuck around to the very end because this photographer kicks butt. Like, he's my friend. He shot this really cool cigar photo. He did all these things. That's what you want to do. Differentiate yourself, right? That is it. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Look at that. I, I got right to o'clock. Right on time.